guys. Good to see everybody, man. Good to be home. Good to be home. Hey, didn't Pastor Jimmy do a great job? Did a great job. Everything, I mean, except for wearing his wife's shoes. Um, that was, a, I saw Jimmy uh, last Sunday. I, I came to early service and we were walking in from the parking lot together and Jimmy goes, hi, sir. How are you this morning? I said, are you wearing your wife's boots? And he said, what? And I said, Amy, are you so mad that Jimmy has your shoes on right now? I said, well, y'all at home going like, dang it, Jimmy, you're going to wear my shoes. Golly. And Jimmy's like, you're a sorry dog. But that's, I mean, <laughs> he's trying to be all thoughtful and nice. And I'm like, why are you wearing your wife's clothes? So, uh, but it didn't, <laughs> I'm the same all the time. I'm always just mean. And so uh, I just need prayer. But man, I'm so glad to be home, glad to be in church and uh, thankful for what I'm on uh, week three of, of recovery. Tuesday will be four weeks out. And so I'm thankful for what God did. Amen. They uh, just, if, I know Trish kept you updated like two hours after surgery. I was up walking to the hospital ready to go. They, they took a, a tumor uh, about that big, a uh, uh, little bit bigger than a grapefruit out, out uh, of me, and it was 100% cancer, and, uh, but it was all encapsulated, so I thank God for that. I got clear markers, I got all that stuff, and so <clears throat> I'm thankful for the covenant doctors here, and, and my Dr. Fenton here, who is my GI doctor, and all the doctors at UT Southwestern. I'm Whew, boy, it was, it was hard to pull for a UT fan the day they were doing my surgery. And so, uh, <laughs> and as soon, man, y'all see my pretty yellow, yellow gown? They got those clothes like you got to wear yellow because you're fall risk. And then you graduate to blue, you know. And I graduated from uh, yellow to Texas Tech clothes right after that. They said, you need to put on those blue clothes. I said, I ain't going to do it. I'm going to wear my tech clothes in here, bless God. Uh, so... Uh, I dressed myself like a grown man, and, and uh, I got out of the yellow dress. It took me two days to get out of it, but I, <laughs> I was glad. That I was thankful for those little yellow socks, though. They were warm. So anyway, hey, let's, let's get into this this morning. We got a new series on uh, baggage, and listen, for, for some of us here, I'm, I'm going to say this, some of us here, this is going to be a, a great series, um, because I believe there are people here that, that want to rid themselves of a lot of drama. I believe there are people here that want to get rid of a lot of drunk, uh, junk and drunk too. I think there's a... Not me, Pastor. I just came the way I came. And just, I was ready for communion is what I was ready for. And so I uh, want to get rid of our trauma and we want to get rid of our past. But not everybody's like that because there's some people here that are hooked on being a victim. Some people are like, they just, I, I just want everybody to feel sorry for me all the time. I don't want to get better. I just want to, woe is me, woe is me, woe is me. I bet you get invited to a lot of parties. You know, you're just, you're, you're just a drag. <laughs> you know, Karen, you know, you're just, you're, <laughs> you're, 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 you're it, it, listen, you, you can't go around being a victim the rest of your life. Sooner or later, you're going to have to heal and you're going to have to heal properly. And so uh, one of the things I love to do is I love to travel, and, uh, but, but what I hate is, is just some things that, that, that I'm never going to get used to, because I, I thought this, I thought when you got married, you, you know, you got married, and you know, you, you could put everything together in one suitcase, come on somebody, and so I, I, when we travel, I think, you know, I'm getting the big suitcase, so we got the, our big suitcase, and so we can get everything in there, boy, was I wrong, you know, and, and so I didn't know that, and so for, for Trish, Trish has got like a big old bag like this, and, and it's got all of her stuff in it. And then we got another bag, just, it's just called the bathroom bag. Just, it's got lipstick and hair stuff and flattener and iron. I, I don't, 
bunch of junk in there. You know what I'm saying? It's like she's going to a, a construction job. Anyway, got all kinds of stuff and extension cords, everything you need in there to pull it off. And I'm like, bless God, you know, so we, we can't get all of our stuff. And, and then on top of that, she's got to have her blanket and she's got to have her, uh, her other little carry on. She's got her magazines and, and all this other junk. And then she's got to have her neck pillow. It's, it's exhausting, you know? And so but but then then for me, I, I found out maybe I'm a little bougie too, <laughs> because when I go, I got to have my iPad, I got to have my laptop, I got to have my AirPods. Yeah, I, I'm owned by Apple. I am a slave to Apple, you know. And so I got to have I got to have my Kindle. I got to have all that stuff together in in my backpack, all my charging stuff. And and then if I'm going somewhere to speak, like if I'm going to preach, then I got to have another bag just for my shoes. Because I, 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 sh- if you don't know this about me, this is a true thing. I am very OCD. Uh, and, and a lot of people don't know this about me. They think I'm joking about it. I cannot leave my house without my clothes matching. It, I, my, my j- people that have been working for me for years have never seen me come to work without my clothes. My, my gear, I look good all the time is what I'm trying to tell you. <laughs> My gear is always on point, and, and, and so I can't do it. I, I have to iron my clothes. If you come to my house, and, and it's just during the week, my clothes match. If I'm just sitting around watching TV, my clothes match. Then not only do they match, I iron them before I go do it. I, I, if I go to the gym, like if I'm giving somebody a ride to the gym, and <laughs> I... <laughs> I iron my clothes to do that. I just, I, it's just an OCD thing about me. I can't stand. And when people don't match, I just go, oh, I just, how did you, you, you need a roommate or, uh, or somebody to help you get dressed. You, you don't ever see those people in the mall and you're like, oh my God, they live alone, you know? And so anyway, and so I, I, I've got to have all that stuff. And, and what I'm saying is it's, it's a lot. It's a lot for, for me to carry. That, like, this would be my setup. This, if I'm going to preach, this would be my setup. And it's a lot to carry all this. And then Trisha's got her two or three bags. And it's us two trying to get to the counter with, with six suitcases and all this stuff. And, and, and so what I'm saying is I don't enjoy the travel process or the journey, but I love the destination. Does that make sense? I, I don't like the preparation, but I love getting there. And, and what I've noticed by traveling all the time is on, on airplanes is so many people have now their carry-on luggage. They just, they just carry their luggage on. They got that one bag that can go down the aisle and it fits in the, the thing. And huge amounts of people are, are carrying their luggage on. And, and, and so the reason they do that is so they don't got to stand around that carousel, come on, at the end, and, and you got to wait, beep, and you got to wait for it to all the way go around, and they don't got to claim their luggage at the carousel. They can just jump right off the flight and, and, and take whatever they got with them wherever they're going and not have to wait. They're, they don't have to wait to claim it, and what I've noticed is that doesn't only just happen physically, that happens spiritually, is that a lot of people don't like to claim their luggage. <laughs> they they don't want to like they don't want to admit how much they're really carrying. Can, do we got some real people? If I've been gone, I hope I'm at the right church. I feel like I've been gone and y'all got Presbyterian on me. And so it's your fault, Jimmy. It's what happens when you wear your wife's shoes. And so it happens spiritually. They want to claim it. We don't want to admit that we have bang, baggage. And so what we do is we just carry it around everywhere we go. And the reality is that everybody in this room has got some kind of baggage. And, and someplace, somewhere in our life where something happened. And for many of us, when it first happened, we thought, you know what? It's not a big deal. It hurt a little, but I'll get over it. But, but I'll manage it. And what we do is we learn how to carry it. We learn how to compensate. We learn how to shift the weight. But the next thing you know, it gets heavier and heavier because life just keeps happening. How many of you know what I'm talking about? And it just keeps happening and we're not enjoying life and we're not enjoying the journey, not at all, not because the destination of heaven is bad. It's just that we're carrying so many things that we shouldn't be carrying that life has become more of a burden than it is a joy. And so, so I, I, I'm cut. I got cut from here all the way to here to here. Jimmy said they, they put a J on me for Jimmy. <laughs> 
dream on, Jimmy. Anyway, so I'm cut like that. And, and, and what I, I, I had to learn how to get out of bed because you use these muscles every day. And, and now that you get your whole core cut, you got to figure out different muscles. I had muscles sore that I didn't even know I had muscles there. Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Amen. Said, I'm going through it right now, bless God, Pastor. I, I can't even get out of this chair. I need you to hurry up, though. Anyway, but what I'm saying is, I, because I had a trauma, I, I, I had to get out of bed, but I couldn't do it the way I used to do, so I just had to find a new way to do it. I just compensated. Come on, somebody help me. I just com- the, 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 the pain didn't change. I just learned how to deal with it. Am, am I helping anybody here today? And, and so how, how do we get here? How do we do that? Where, where did all this baggage come from? And I want to give you a few ideas of where I think it comes from. But I want to ask you this question as we start. And I want you to ask yourself this question. Write it down. Keep this in mind. What am I carrying around that shouldn't be a part of my journey? What am I carrying around that shouldn't be a part of my trip? And, and, and first of all, your husband or, or your wife has to come. You, you, <laughs> you know, yeah, they, they, they have to come. But what issue in your life is on the trip with you that shouldn't be a part of it? And, and what do you got to do to get rid of it? Well, here's the first thing I would say. You got to identify in order to get rid of it. So what could be causing us to carry some things around? And here's one of my thoughts. I think a lot of us have unfulfilled expectations. Unfulfilled expectations. And, you know, I thought it was going to be one way and it wasn't that way. I thought it was going to be the marriage of my dreams and it was the marriage of my nightmare. (laughs) Somebody, I can't say amen because he's with me. But (laughs) we, (laughs) we struggle and, and, you know, I thought being a mom was going to be awesome, and then I had to go get my kids out of jail. <laughs> right? Or c- can we be real? And, 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 and so, and what happens is we, we, we have this good basis now because they're unfulfilled. We get angry, and we get mad, and anger always occurs when you want something, and you didn't get it, and you had the expectation of one thing, but something totally different happened, and now you're upset, and now you're unfulfilled, and you got a big bag of disappointment. Proverbs chapter 13 says it this way, hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. And so many people in this room are on their way to heaven, but their heart is sick. (laughs) They got some unfulfilled expectations and, and, and because they had a little bit of hope. And what they hoped for never happened the way they thought it was going to happen. They had this idea and this idea changed and were just miserable because of it. And I think a lot of the problem is, is that we have this unrealistic expectation of life. I, I, I think it's called the 2020 gospel, which I don't think is a gospel at all. Or you could call it the Americanized gospel, which I don't think is a gospel at all. And that's what we think that God should obligate himself to make heaven earth. We think it should just be shoots and landers and and candy corn and unicorns and that everything should be okay. But you got to realize that Jesus came to rescue you from a world full of trouble. Jesus said, he promised this, in this world, you are going to have trouble. I have come to help you overcome the world that you're in. Come on, that's good news. Listen, we live in the greatest country in the world, and I think we expect earth to be heaven sometimes, but it's far from it. Now, I'm going to say something, and some of you are going to push back, and some of you may get mad at me, but can I tell you, I know it's 2020, and the media and the world tells us it's, okay, it's not okay for us to disagree. Can I tell you, we can disagree. We can agree to disagree and still be friends. So I'm going to say something in a minute, and you may disagree with me, and that's okay. You can be wrong. But (laughs) here's here's what I'm going to say. Listen, it's it's really bad for our kids right now, in my opinion. Why, Todd? Things that people, we give out participation ribbons. What? 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 Why am I going to practice and sweat for an hour and a half to get a ribbon? When the guy playing in front of me is not better than me. 
Yeah, but we paid for them to play. Listen, not everybody's kid needs to be in that sport. I coached football. I coached Hunter since the time he was five until the time he went into junior high. I had to go tell some parents, listen, your kid doesn't want to play football. Oh, yes, they do. No, they cry as soon as you leave. <laughs> and here's what, here's what I'm trying. They're going to get somebody else hurt. Because when the people come running at them, they do this. Now, they may be good at something, uh, <laughs> at something besides this contact sport. Maybe baseball, maybe basketball. I, I, but this is not their sport. And you always got that dad go, yeah, but I played football. Okay, just because you did doesn't mean your kids should. And we shouldn't have to give them a ribbon to make them feel better about themselves. Or, or here's the thing, let's go play a game for two hours and not keep score. Everyone wins. No, that's not what happens in life. You are not setting your kids up for reality. Not everybody gets a job. Not everybody gets a raise. Not everybody gets a promotion. Life happens, and we're doing our kids an injustice by telling them, it's going to be okay. When you come home, there'll be a unicorn in the yard, and you can play with him. Come on. We're not preparing them. Are, am I making sense? Yes. Everybody at school's got one. Well, whoosh. You're not everybody's kids. You're mine. I'm not dad. Dad, everybody's got a cell phone. Part of the kids all got jobs. Dad, they're like 10. I was 10, bless God. I was walking uphill in the snow with a... I come home, man, my arm would be broke. My dad, oh, my eye had worked scratches like that on my eyeball, bless God. <laughs> like, no, my arm's really broke. Like, it's not supposed to be in a nest, Dad. I'll go take the trash out. You'll be okay. <laughs> Listen, we're not setting anybody up for realizing how difficult this world can be. And that's why we got all these people that are going around tearing up other people's stuff because there's no consequences. I'm, I'm just telling you, I'm not against, listen, I want you to, I'm not against a protest. I am not against a protest. What I am against is you tearing up somebody's stuff and stealing things and telling me that you're trying to bring honor to somebody. That's what our nation is for. You have an amendment. Yes, go stand up for your rights. I am for that. I'm just not for us hating one another and killing one another because we got different colored skin. I'm not okay with that. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? Man, we, we shouldn't be teaching our kids to hate the fire department and hate the police department. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a policeman. And I know there's some bad cops. Guess what? There's some bad preachers. That don't make me quit going to church. I got food poisoning, but y'all can see I ain't quit eating. <laughs> Here's another reason we got baggage. We got untreated pain. You know what the culprit of untreated pain is? We were all trained to smile no matter what's going on in our life. All hell's breaking loose at home. We come to church. How you doing? I'm doing good. God bless you. Good to see you. Glad y'all are here. Hallelujah. And we got to give that church answer when the fact of the matter is all hell's breaking loose in our marriage. We don't even know if we want to be in this thing together. I can't stand my kids right now because they're all just, they know more than everybody, but they don't know nothing at all. I can't stand the people I work with. And the truth is, I don't really feel like family because if I did, I would tell you the truth when I come to your church. Instead of hide behind a smile. And, and we learn the art of hiding things. And our kids grow up to be liars and we wonder why. Well, I'm preaching better than your amen and you ain't ready for me. I ain't got to preach in three weeks. I'm a little bit mean. 
And we're keeping things on the inside. And you're like, how you doing? Man, I'm okay. It's no big deal. When the truth is, it is a big deal. We didn't give it the attention that it needed. So not only does it not get treated, but because of the way you handle it, it never heals the way it should have healed. And Jeremiah prophesies this in Jeremiah 6. They dress the wound of my people as though it were not serious. Peace, peace, they will say when there is no peace. You'll be okay, but I'm not okay. Ah, you'll be fine, but I'm not fine. Rub some dirt on it. It didn't help. Quit crying. The reason I'm crying is because I got a hurt. I got a pain, and I'm exhausted of coming to church and pretending like I'm okay when I'm not okay. And the truth of the matter is hell is breaking loose in my life. And I'm tired of being somebody that I'm really not. And all I really want is somebody to get in the middle of this mess and tell me I am in it to win it. You won't do life alone. Here's another reason you may not be okay. You got an unresolved yesterday. The issue here is that we don't deal with it quickly enough. And, and, And here's some bad news. Stuff is going to happen to you. I would love to tell you it's not, but stuff is going to happen. And the problem is not that bad things happen to us or things that get said to us or the mistakes we make. It's that we put it off and we delay the repair that needs to happen. Let me show you what happens when you don't deal with things in their proper time according to the word of God. Ephesians 4, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. The Bible said... (laughs) You're going to have days when you're going to get really, really mad at people. Mama said there'd be days like that. Huh? There's going to be days when you're really mad at people, but don't go to sleep on it. Resolve it quickly, because if you don't, you're going to leave the opportunity for the devil to come in and counsel you over the situation. And the devil's never going to give you the right perspective. The devil's never going to tell you what's going on. And the devil doesn't come in because you got mad. Watch this. He gets a foothold because you didn't deal with it when you got mad. It's not that you got mad. It's that you left it unresolved. He healed people, healed people, hurt people, hurt people. There's a reason that that person is meaner than a rattlesnake. Let's find out what the the problem is so we can help heal them rather than judge them, rather than turn our nose up at them. There's a reason everybody in this room is the way they are. And if we would take time to find out that reason rather than judge, maybe we could help somebody. Here's another reason. You got an unhealthy view of the way you see yourself. Unhealthy view of the way you see yourself. Listen, this is a struggle for many people. I struggled with this. My parents told me they loved me. The problem is, is not everybody at school loved me the way my parents loved me. I've I've been overweight my whole life. I grew, well, I've never been overweight. I've just been too short for the weight I carry. Let me just. (laughs) I grew up very poor. And and how many of you know that kids can be mean? And if you don't know kids can be mean, it was because you were the mean kid at school. And, and even, look, even, look, since I've been sick, I got doctors in Dallas, and so they call, you know, you can teleconference now, call you on your laptop, Ugh, high tech. <laughs> My doctor, I got this endocrinologist because I got diabeticals, and the, uh, <laughs> she called me the other day, and she's an Indian doctor, so I'm not making fun, I'm just telling what she says to me. Sir? You need to go ahead and get a flu shot. I said, I ain't getting no flu shot. So listen to me. You need to go ahead and get the flu shot. I said, I ain't getting a flu shot. I ain't never had a flu. I ain't going to go get a flu shot. Well, I tell you, you need to be very, very careful of the COVID. The COVID will not be good for you, my friend. I said, I already done had the COVID. I had fever for two days, and I know not everybody has this experience. I'm not trying to. I said, I got fever for two days, had a cough for a couple days. I was good to go. Oh, friend, you're so very, very lucky because you are fat and diabetic. (laughs) 
Because you're fat and diabetic, it would not be good for you at all. I said, dang. Um. That lady didn't tell me I was overweight. She didn't tell me I was obese. She went straight from my jugular, just told me I was fat. On top of that, Aaron, I had to give her 50 bucks to tell me that I was fat. I could have gave myself a 20 and went down to Freddy's and got me a shake or something. <laughs> I was like, you are the mean kid at school. Anyway, so. <laughs> but I grew up because of that. I grew up fighting all the time. Most people don't believe that about me. Because listen, when you really get saved, it ought to change the old you into a new you. Right? And, and so I grew up a very angry person, a very mad person. But, but, but here's what's crazy. I, I was always voted the funniest in my class. I won the talent show. The school that I graduated from, I went to that school for one year. I was voted senior class favorite. But none of that mattered to me. You know why? Because I had an unhealthy view of myself. See, people, your friends, oh, you're so pretty. You're this, this, you're this. It doesn't matter what they say if you have an unhealthy view of yourself. It doesn't matter what your yearbook says. If you have an unhealthy view of yourself, those words just go in one ear and they go out the other because you don't see what they see. Am I, am I talking to anybody this morning? They just go in and out. Yeah, come on. That's a good place to say amen. And, and so even in ministry, I, I've never gone to Bible school. I don't have a degree. I, there are people, we got doctors, we got lawyers, we got nurses. We got, we got people in here that got more degrees than a thermometer. And, 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 and look, I barely graduated high school. Huh? Look, I went to tech. I had to take a math class. This, this is how dumb I am in math. I had to take a, <laughs> I had to take a math class for no credit. Zero credit. And I had to pass that class so I could sign up for a class to get credit for. I failed the class for no credit. So when Jesus called me to preach, I just, I just tore out the book of numbers. I'm like, I'm not. <laughs> but there are people, I'm like, Lord, I got all people from, what, what am I going to say to anybody at church? I'm not educated. I don't have those things that they have. Yes, I've been ordained. I went to global university. I, I, those, but but, but to, to seminary, you're in, I've never done any of those things. But, but I want you to hear me. God has a total different view of who you are. And if you are living your life where the only assessment of you is the assessment you have given yourself, you are going to have a ton of baggage. And the worst part of it is the baggage you're carrying is not even accurate. It's not even true. And I don't want you to take my opinion for it. I'm going to give you the Bible. Can we agree the Bible's true all the time? Amen. Look at this. Romans chapter 12. This is the message version. The only, somebody say only. only. The only accurate way to understand ourselves is by what God is and by what he does for us, not by what we are and what we do for him. Did you just hear that? The Bible is never wrong. And it just said the only way to understand ourselves is by what God is and what he does for us, not by what we are and we do for him. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen. The real view is not what your peers have to say. The real view is not what your friends have to say. The real view is not what your family has to say. The real view is what God has to say about you. He's the one that created you. He knows more about you than anybody else. And God says that you have a purpose and you have a destiny and you are wonderfully and beautifully made. That's true all the time. Here, it's time to get rid of the bag of insecurity. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but it's time to let insecurity go out the window. Here's another reason we, we carry around baggage. We have unrepented sin. Now, I want you to, to notice that I didn't say unconfessed sin. I didn't even say unforgiven sin. I think a ton of us have baggage because we came to church, we heard a message on a topic, we got convicted, we confessed, but the problem is we never changed direction. So we never repented because repent is more than I'm sorry. It means I'm going to turn around and I'm going to do something I've never done before because if you always do what you've always done, you'll always be where you've always been. 
Repentance means I'm going to go on a new track. So we may have some baggage, not because we didn't ask for forgiveness, but because we never made a life change. And so we're blaming God for things we didn't change about ourselves. If you forgave me, why do I still have a struggle? You still got a struggle because you didn't change. You went right back to it. It's like a dog going back to his vomit. Think about it. When you get out of church, you don't go back to no new sin. Listen, this is why we have kids' church. Go, I'm fixing to say something you're going to wish your kids was in Kids City for. When you get out of church, it's not like you go find a new sex. Sex is all the same. It's not like there's a new drink. It's the same alcohol. It's the, there's not a new drug. It just got some kind of different, some, some more... Battery acid added to it. So now we got this new. And we think, oh, this is new. This is new. No, it's a dog going back to his vomit. And the reason when you get out of church, you go back to what you were doing before you go to church is because the devil doesn't have the power to create. All he can do is imitate. So you always go back to what you know. Only God can create. And so if we don't change, we always go back to what we're comfortable with. Peter denied Christ. Next thing you see, Peter, what's he doing? Going back to fishing. Didn't Jesus call him from fishing? But because he felt like he had given up and felt like he had betrayed Christ, he felt like God couldn't love him anymore, he went back to what he knew. So when Jesus gets resurrected from the dead, listen to what he says. (laughs) he said, go tell the disciples that I'm alive and I'm well. And he called Peter by name. Why? Because he knew Peter had to feel pretty bad about his choices. And Peter had to feel pretty bad about his decisions. Because the last time he said he didn't know Christ, he was close enough to look Jesus eye to eye. He said, go tell Peter, I know what he did, but what he done is not who he are. And let him know I'm going to build a New Testament church and I need a preacher. My God, I need a pastor. I need somebody to step up and to preach. And when he did, 3,000 people got saved on the very first day. And the next time, 5,000. Somebody give God a good shot of praise. What you've done is not who you are. Come on, aren't you glad for that? Look at what David said, Psalms 32. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Baggage. My strength was sapped as in the heat of summer. Selah. You know what that means? Think about what I just said. David said, think about what I just said. We said, we're sorry, but we never took the steps to walk out of the mess. And so we carry around a bag of bad choices. Not because we were not convicted. Not because we're not forgiven. Just because we're not repentant. And we didn't change our direction. Am I I helping anybody here today? So how do I fix it, Todd? What's the best thing about traveling, in my opinion? Check your baggage. What do you mean? My favorite thing is when I get to the counter and they say, your bags will be waiting for you at your destination. Like, oh! You mean I can walk through the airport without having to carry all this stuff around? I can eat. I don't got to carry all this weight. I ain't got to try to find a place where I can sit down because if I get there early enough, I could go get something to eat. And I ain't got to find a place to carry all this bag plus Trisha's bag. You mean I could check all this mess with you? And when I get there, it'll be waiting for me. So now I can enjoy my destination or I can enjoy the journey because I don't got all the weight to carry with me. Yes, I will check my baggage. Go on, girl. Check that thing on in. So I want to show you today how you can check your baggage with with one spiritual truth that will change your life. And you're going to hear this scripture every week probably as I do this series. And it's this, 2 Corinthians 10. For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. In other words, Todd, what does that mean? Here we go. In other words, you cannot fix a spiritual problem with a natural solution. You know why all this racism and hate can't be fixed? Because it's a demonic spirit. 
It's a demonic spirit. And we're trying to have rallies and protests rather than prayer meetings. It don't matter how much you change your clothes if you don't change your heart. It's a heart issue. If you hate somebody because they're black or white or brown or yeah, it's a heart issue. It's a demonic spirit on the inside of you. I don't feel that way, but that's why you still trapped with a demon. Preacher PT, are oh, you doing so good? Thank you, boy. It's a demonic spirit, man. Hate doesn't come from God. Hate something you're born with. Not from God. Think about it. You got to spank your kids to share. Why? Because it's in their nature to be me, 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 me. And this is what this whole world's about. Me, me. When Jesus is all about us, us, us. I'm preaching better than you're amen. Some of you go, I don't know where I'm at on that. That's because you need to get saved. Here we go. So, <laughs> the weapons, listen, you cannot fix a spiritual problem with a natural solution. Self-help books ain't going to do it. Pills ain't going to do it. Alcohol's not going to do it. There's a better way. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have de divine power to demolish strongholds. Stronghold is the biblical word for baggage. Something that is attached to you has a stronghold on you. And it's the one thing that when you gave your heart to Jesus, you got free from everything. But you got that one thing that keeps tripping you up. Am I preaching? You got that one thing that keeps messing you over. And, and what is that one thing for you? What's the baggage for you? The Greek word for stronghold is a word called uki rama. Get you some of that. <laughs> but when I was reading it, because I only went to Dunbar, I thought it said Uchi Mama. But anyway. <laughs> but it turns out it has a whole nother meaning than Uchi Mama. And, and, and here's what it means. Stronghold means this. This is powerful. Please don't miss this. If you're a note taker, please, for the love of God, write down what I'm fixing to say. The stronghold is a prisoner locked by deception. It's living your life by something that's not even true. That's what a stronghold. Listen to me. Your baggage, watch this, is not based on a reality. It's based on a lie. It seems real. It feels real. It seems like a fact, but it's based on a lie. And you will never be free as long as you live your life based on something that's not even true. You're a prisoner of deception. If, if that's true, and it is, then Todd, what's the solution? It's very simple. If the whole problem is a lie, then all we need is the truth. All we need is the truth. And that's what you're going to hear for the next five weeks. All you're going to hear is truth. And here's one of God's truth in 2 Corinthians 10. We demolish arguments. You know what the arguments are? That's the trash that the devil whispers in your ear every day. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. How are we going to do that? I'm glad you asked. Romans chapter 12. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. Are you ready to change? Yes. I'm going to tell you how. How do we change? By the renewing of your mind. We're going to put some fresh thoughts on the inside of you every week in this series. And I'm going to give you some more. Ephesians 4, you were taught to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds. In other words, what that scripture just said, I just need you to believe it. Jesus said it this way in John 8. Then you will know the truth, not have it on a coffee table or carry it around in your phone, but then you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Come on, somebody say amen. So we're going to hear truth every week in this series. I'm going to give you three things. It's going to take me just about five minutes to drop this on you. This is not rocket science, but you would be surprised how many people don't believe these three simple things that I'm about to give you. And I'm not just talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about people that say they're believers and don't believe these three things I'm fixing to tell you. Here's the, num here's the first one. No matter what you've done, God still loves you. God still loves you. People are convinced that God is wanting some kind of religious performance, some kind of perfection that, that, that you can't even measure up to. So you can't stand to be around him because your view of God is so distorted. Because you're, you're actually convinced that it's hard to please God. And it's not even true. I, I, I never, for myself, I never really understood the love of God until I had my own kid. 
And what do you mean by that, Todd? My son has done things that disappoint me, but my love for my son has never changed. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? That's the love of God. We do things that disappoint him, but his love for us never changed. And so I don't know what your view of God is, but, but, but what you need to know is if God slept, I love this. He would wake up in the middle of the night thinking about you. You would be on, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on the side because mine would be on the front, but it would, <laughs> it would make it, you would make it. It just wouldn't be on the front where, you know. Why? He's madly in love with you. As soon as you start believing the simple little truth that God's not mad at you, he's madly in love with you. He doesn't always like what we do, but he's always motivated to help us get out of our messes because he is the rescue plan and help is what we all need. Can you say amen? Amen. We've all read this from, from time to time and you know this by heart, but let me give this to you from the message Bible, John 3, 16. This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son, his one and only son. And that's why, and this is why, so that no one need be destroyed by believing in him. Anyone, somebody say anyone. Anyone can have a whole and lasting life. God didn't go to all the trouble of sending his son merely to point an accusing finger, telling the world how bad it was. What did he come to do? He came to help. Come on, isn't that some of the best news you've heard all day? He came to help. Here's the second thing. Not only did God love you, God can set set me free. God can free me. Some of you believe the lie that that it's just this way. It's always going to be this way. My daddy was a drunk. I'm going to be a drunk. My daddy was mean. I'm going to be mean. And that's a lie straight from the pits of hell. You have the power to break that iniquity off of your life. You have the power. I grew up like that. My dad was an alcoholic until I was about 11 years old, and then my dad broke that iniquity off of my life. I struggled with drugs, but I never really struggled with it. I just drank to drink, but it wasn't something I had to do. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? You can break that iniquity off your life, and so uh, instead of being free, we just learn how to compensate for the crap we pick up walking through this world. We just learn to compensate for all the junk, for the baggage we carry. Listen to me, it's a lie. Never give up on the hope of being free. I don't care if you came in here with an addiction this morning. I don't care if you're struggling with a problem. I want you to hear out of this good looking, slightly overweight preacher's mouth. Never give up on the hope of being free. And let me give you a scripture for it. Romans chapter eight, verse one. You no longer have to live under a continuous, low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal, brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. I hope that when you walk into the worship center on Sunday morning or Wednesdays or whatever, if you're going to freedom, I hope that every time you walk into this place, you can say, I don't know what it is about this church, but but it's like a breath of fresh air for me. When I come here, I feel better about myself. When I come here, the message comes alive to me. He gives it to me on a way I can understand it. Listen, it's not only that God loves you, he can set me free, but here's the last one. God will restore you. God will restore you. God wants to get you back to your God-given original design. Huh. Huh. Seems like I've heard that somewhere before. Where'd you hear that, Pastor Todd? Seems like I've even seen it somewhere before. If you came in through the front door by the coffee shop, you walked by the sign. And our sign says on the wall, TWZ exists for the purpose to love you where you are, right, to where you are, to where you should always been, and to get you back to God's original design for your life. We get nothing from tearing you down. We have everything to give by helping you become the man and the woman that God's called you to build, to be. Your children are gonna be better kids. Your marriage is gonna be better marriages when you get back to your God original design. Psalm 71 says it this way. Though you have made me see my troubles, many and bitter. How many of you can identify with troubles? Many and bitter. Watch this. You will restore my life again from the depths of the earth. 
you again bring me up. Isn't that a great promise right there? This is a moment that God can do something in your life if you only believe. But you got to be in relationship with him to do this work. You got to be in relationship with him to do this work. Now, you, you, you've come to church. You've heard the story. You've heard the message. And it's up to you. Because even though physically you may not have all these things, let me put this Texas Tech bag up here. <laughs> and I know what you're thinking. Tech's not doing that good. Neither is the Longhorns. <laughs> and that makes my day better. And neither is the Sooners. And that makes my day better. But physically, you didn't come in like this. But spiritually, there's a lot of you got more bags than this. Some of you got addiction bags. Some of you got mindset bags. And, and, and here's what I know. This, they're difficult because this one's got four wheels. And so, you know, Jimmy, it's easy to carry. But this one only has two. So I got to make sure I carry it right. And even carrying it right, what's crazy is this backpack just has a way of just shifting and falling so I can, man, I can maybe learn another way to carry it. But the truth of the matter is even though it's easy to carry, the weight is still there. It's up to you. How you go home today is all up to you. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. Truth is all I gave you today. I didn't give you my opinion. I gave you truth. And, and I'm not trying to minimize your trauma. I want you to hear me. I'm not trying to say that the hurt didn't hurt. It, 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 it did what it did. But here's what we do. We fail to realize that we're in a jail cell where there's no bars. It's a deception. It's smoke and mirrors, but it feels real. You know why it feels real? Because rather than get out of the jail, you decorated it. You moved in a couch. You hung some pictures on the wall. You got comfortable with it because you were convinced this is the way it always is going to be. And it's a lie straight from hell. Trish and I went to, to Vegas and we went to the David Copperfield show and, and Trish got caught on stage and it was awesome because I was excited um, that I knew somebody famous. And so she gets caught on stage and she's from here to this edge to here, right? And there's nothing there. Nothing, absolutely nothing. And this guy puts this sheet out. You know, David Copper puts this sheet out. And then he's like, goes over here and he starts talking and then he comes back over and he goes, Phew. and there's this big old car. And I'm like, oh my God, how did he get that car there? So I can't figure it out. So Trish gets back to the chair and says, hey, like, I know you can't say it because everybody else is around and he don't want to ruin the trip. How did he get that car there? Trish said, I don't have any clue. I said, my God, you're like 16 inches from the car. <laughs> like, I love you, but this is a blonde moment. How do you not know? <laughs> How do you, I, I have no clue. Because the, mor see, what the enemy does is he's always got you busy over here while the trick's happening over here. And you buy into the show and you don't really realize that it cost you your vision of what you could have seen. You miss the whole power of seeing the car appear because the enemy never wants you to see the car. He just wants you to buy into the mirage. And so you miss out on the biggest part of the show. Am I making sense? And some of you came in here with all kinds of luggage. How you leave is up to you. But this is a, a no judgment zone. A no judgment zone. You share what you want to share. We got my altar workers to come. You share what you want to share with these altar workers. You don't want to share it? Don't share it. But I tell you this. 
Jesus forgives our sins, right? But according to James, there's only some things in our heart that can be healed by confessing them to others. Confess your faults to one another. Pray for one another that you may be what? Healed. Jesus forgives, but there's a, there's a healing that transplaces. When we get all that garbage out, when we leave, it's up to you. Some of you may say, you know what? I don't want to claim my baggage today. And you're going to have to spend another week of wrestling with it. And the bad thing is you're going to go home and your kids are going to watch you wrestle. You think they don't know what's going on? Boy, your kids know what's going on better than you know what's going on. Ask them. The reason we don't ask is because we don't want to know. I want every head bow this morning. I want you to ask him, Holy Spirit, what if I have on my journey that's not supposed to be a part of this trip? What am I carrying around that I shouldn't be carrying around? Because the fact of the matter is even when you check your bags, If it weighs more than 50 pounds, you got to pay extra. 50 is all they say that they, the, the, the guys that lift luggage all day, all day, that's their only job. They say, man, if it weighs more than 50 pounds, we're not really conditioned to do that all day. Guys that their whole job is lifting weight, have a disclaimer. It's, we're going to charge you more because we're not really conditioned to lift more than 50 pounds all day. And yet some of you are carrying around big suitcases that weigh more than that. Whether you come to the altar or not, nobody's looking around. You just raise your hand. You say, Pastor Todd, I've got some baggage I need to check. Raise it. Come on, let me see your hand. Don't miss this. Please don't miss this, man. Yeah, whether you come or not. Yes, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Now, here's the opportunity. Some of you raised, some of you didn't. Once you raised, you can put it down. Here's what I want you to do. Will you take another step of faith and instead come to this altar? Will you come and let's just check in some baggage this morning? Let's leave here freer than the way you came. There are already some that are up here. You won't be by, don't wait on anybody else. I want you to move right now. God bless you, men of God. God bless you for having the courage to step up. God bless you. Yeah, man, let's get this done. Let's get this started. Listen, it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to stay that way. It's not okay to be that way. Let's deal with the issue today. Let's not go home and, and be in pain another day. It's your choice. Yeah, come on, man. This may be one of the biggest altar calls we ever do. We need some more people. Y'all come help. I can't hear you. Need some more ladies. If I got some more ladies. Here comes Polly right now. Little ones right here. Nicole, Lisa, thank you. If I got any more female altar workers outside, even if you're working the table, this is the most important thing you're going to do all day. Even if you're not signed up to serve today, I need your help. We're talking life and death. Life and death is happening right now at the altar. We're giving life to hope, and we're putting death to destruction. Amen? So some of you raised your hands. You didn't come. I want to pray for you. There's some more men over here if we need some more men. There's some more men. You raised your hand. Father God, you saw every hand that went up this morning. And Lord, I, I, I just want to bless you. Forgive them the courage, whether they're watching online. And if you're watching online, we have moderators that are ready to pray with you right there online. You can just put your hand up there online. I, it's, I may sound crazy to you, but we want to pray with you today. We want to help you with it today. But Lord, you saw every hand go up. You saw what's going on online, whether it's in Lubbock or Texas, around the United States or around the world. Pain is not just conditioned to a geographical area. It's in every one of us. Every one of us has some kind of baggage today. And I thank you, Lord, that you have sent us to a house of God to be restored this morning. You have given us words of truth from your word, affirmations from the word of God, scriptures, that the word says that heaven and earth will pass away, but this word that we read this morning will never pass away. And I elevate that truth in the hearts and lives of people today, God, that they will hear 
the truth of God's word over the lies and the deception of the enemy. And we rebuke the devil in the name of Jesus from trying to destroy our life. And we are inviting you, Holy Spirit, to reveal to us today what it is we're carrying on this journey that shouldn't be a part of the journey. And we're releasing it to you, God. We're tired of carrying it around. We're not embarrassed of it. We're just tired of carrying something we were never supposed to carry. We're not ashamed of it because shame, guilt, and condemnation doesn't come from you. We're just tired of carrying something we weren't supposed to carry. So we release it to you. In Jesus' name I pray. And the whole church said,